singing. So good to be with you all uh, this morning. And I, I just have to say hello to, uh, on the computer, to Randy and Myra and Gary and Sarita and Maria. Uh, not wanting to miss anyone else, but uh, there may be others that are out too. We want to thank the Lord for them. So good to be with you. I want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're going to look at, uh, now the Lord had already put this on my heart before I came, but I was looking in the foyer uh, when I came in and I saw that you had already been looking at some women of the Bible, right? Recently? Well, this is, I'm not sure if this one was on the list. It wasn't on the list that I saw, Hannah, but um, she would certainly be one of them. She would certainly be one of them. And I want us to think for a minute, before we look at the story, which is fascinating, when we study the word of God, we always have to study in context, right? We, we uh, want to do inductive Bible study. We want to study with certain study tools, follow methodical Bible study technique, and see the historical context and the theological context, all of these things. And when we do this with 1 Samuel, uh, especially the first few chapters, we see that, unfortunately, the nation of Israel, which at that time is God's testimony on earth, his primary testimony, I should say, because he had testimony in nature and he has testimony in conscience, right? Romans chapter one tells us that. But his, he, had, he had elevated his testimony when he set apart the nation of Israel going back to Abraham in Genesis 12. And of course, they've had, they, you know, they have a cyclical uh, history up and down, just like the history of the church, just like the history of Bible Truth Chapel, just like the history of Thomas Wheeler, or any of us plug your name in, right? We, we struggle with consistency. I think that's been in my journal, one of the words that I'm consistent, be consistent this year, Thomas, do it, see what you, you know, depending on the Holy Spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit, but a little more consistent in holiness, right? And always growing, always part of that cooperation with the spirit and the growth curve. Well, the nation, I'll go so far as to say, the nation of Israel was almost completely destroyed at this time. Now, it would take a few hours to prove that from the Bible, I can, I believe I can prove that to you, but we don't have time to do that. So you'll have to maybe do that study on your own, or maybe in, in future times, I'll try to come back to that. But, but just, just one little window into seeing it comes out in chapter two, where we see that the uh, sons of the high priest, now Eli, or Eli, I prefer, I prefer to call him Eli. El is the shortened form of Elohim, which is the Hebrew name for God. So Eli means my God. Now, depending on the tone of voice for his mother and dad, when he came into the world, it was like, my God or my God. You know, maybe it was a dedication, my God. You know, I'm, that's the way I prefer to think of it. But that's his name, Eli. But he had two sons. And verse 12 tells us they were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Later we find out in chapter two that they were sons of Belial. Belial is a name for the devil. They were sons of the devil. Now, now that's pretty bad when the leadership, at least an old man by this time, he's about to hand it off to Hophni and Phinehas, his two sons. They're part of the priesthood, remember? At this time, Israel was a theocracy. The monarchy would, would come soon. Samuel would actually be the last of the judges and the one to anoint the first and the second king of Israel. That would begin the monarchy. But here it's a theocracy, which actually is the best form of government that believers can have. I don't know if you know that, if you thought about it, but it's the form that gives you the most liberty the most freedom to serve the lord but it's contingent on this that you walk in the lord especially your leadership 
right? That you're obedient to the word of God. But they had, they were, you know, it was tribal. And they had various tribal leaders. And the, and the priests were supposed to teach the word of God. Lead in prayer. Help with the sacrifices in the tabernacle, which was in Shiloh at the time. Now, I didn't get a chance to ask Randy and Myra if they got to go to Shiloh. But when I was there in Israel in 2019, and one of the things, I want to go to Shiloh, and we made it to Shiloh. And they started, in fact, it's the, the Christian archaeology group out of Pennsylvania, led by Dr. Bryant Wood, who's a believer, uh, started an excavation. They got permission from the Antiquities Department in Israel to start this excavation. Shiloh had been excavated in like 1958 and abandoned. I saw it in 1996 and it was weeds everywhere. And it was, well, they'd come back a few years ago. And one of the things I stood there where the tabernacle was. In fact, they found the footprint where the tabernacle was. They've excavated to that level. And they're still excavating, you know, right now as we speak. And I stood there and looked around, you know, it's on a hill, a fairly low hill. And then there are sloping hills all the way around like this, all the way around. So you can picture someone would come out of a tent over on this hill. They'd open the tent and they'd see the, the tabernacle, the smoke. You remember it was continual offering, the light of the menorah. And then over here, they come out of his tent early in the morning. The sun's coming up in the east. And what's he see? The tabernacle. God was in the center, see, where he should be. But he wasn't in the center of their hearts, of everyone. And, and so this is a serious time in Israel's history. Like I say, it's one of the lowest points. <laughs> and you could look at it and say, you know, that it, it, it's hopeless. Apart from God. And then I look at the times in which we live. Looks pretty hopeless too. On a global scale. Ukraine. Taiwan. Brazil. I couldn't believe it. I thought they really had turned it around in Brazil. Maybe they still will. Unbelievable. For such a time as this, huh? And, and I'll just point you to one other thing we're not going to look at today, but over in chapter seven, the man Samuel, beginning in verse two, is the leader. Eli's died, Hophni and Phinehas have died by this time. The ark was captured and then brought back. So they have the ark, it was in Kariat Jerim. And, and we have this gathering of the nation at Mizpah which is right near Ramah, which is right near about 15 miles north of Jerusalem, right in the center of the country. But about halfway between Shiloh and Jerusalem is Mizpah, in the hill country, right in the center of the country. And this is one of the great revivals in human history occurs. And I would submit to you this, under God, this revival would never have happened without Samuel. And Samuel would never have happened without Hannah. And when all the rewards are doled out at the time, and our Lord does that, Samuel will certainly get rewards, but Hannah's going to get rewards too. I told my mother she died in 2000, went to be with the Lord. She and I were very close. Uh, there were four children, but I, I was probably, well, I was close. We were close. And, uh, and it was a big blow to lose her. And uh, one of the things I would prayed before, I was over in Israel at the time she was dying. And I said, Lord, please let her live to, uh, so I can see her and tell her this before she died, which she gave me. She, she lived two weeks after I got back. And I, I wanted to tell her, you know what? Oh, a lot of the reason I'm in the ministry is because of you. And she tried to just, no, 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 no. She tried to dismiss it. I said, no, no. And then when the, the Lord, he's a just judge. 
and he'll make sure you get credit, rightly so. And I was so glad I wanted her to have that assurance before she died. You know, she, she was totally delighted after that, all the way up to the day she went into coma. <clears throat> and I don't know that Samuel got that opportunity with Hannah. We don't know. You know, it's, the scripture is silent. I don't think Hannah was alive, probably, at the time of this revival in chapter 7, we, but we don't know that either. So that's the backdrop of the story here in chapter one. And the story of Hannah is in chapter one and then the first 10 verses of chapter two. So we read, there was a certain man of Ramathai Zophim, which is Rama, which is today, you'll hear on the news, Ramallah, which is part of the uh, Palestinian territory. We did get to go there in 2019. We had to change uh, the bus. The guide on the bus had to change to go through the checkpoint, but we were able to get, go into Ramallah. But Rama, right there in the center of the area of the mountains of Ephraim, that's the territory. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, of Elihu, of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and Ephraimite. Now that you have to put in again, you have to study the whole Bible, right? Because you get over to First Chronicles chapter six, and you find out he's a Levite, okay? So as a Levite, he could serve in the, the roles that, with the tabernacle. So why does the Bible say he's Ephraimite? Well, Ephraimite was where he lived. He lived in Ephraim, so he's an Ephraimite where he lived, but he was a Levite by, by family. Find that out First Chronicles. And right away we see there's a problem. He had two wives. Now a lot of men may think that, that, uh, that they're worthy of two wives, even though they won't say it. But they're not, and I'm not, and it doesn't work. If you know women at all, it doesn't work. The sisters, are you kidding? How are you gonna divide that up? Who's going to take over the kitchen when it's time and share it and so forth? And then they're always wondering, I wonder if he loves her more than me. Right? God didn't design marriage to be like that. It's, it's, hor it's horrible. It's suffering of one of the worst types. And if, if you're involved, the elders and some others may be involved in marriage counseling. I sometimes... Uh, get involved in it. I'm single, so I usually have a couple there with me, but um, because they, I'm speaking from theory and they're speaking from experience, right? There's a difference, but uh, uh, things are at a serious level in the church right now in the U.S. because of this too. But if you're familiar with the Old Testament, and you know about the blessings and cursings of the law in Deuteronomy 28, which I know you do, Right, that when you see this, you say, uh oh, the nation is under discipline because the blessing of the law was that they would have fruitful wombs. And Elkanah would not have looked for a second wife if Hannah wasn't barren, you see. Does it remind you of a story way back in the early part of Genesis? Abraham and Sarah with their names, okay. So here we, you know, see this sin repeated. But he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Oops. What happened with Sarah and Hagar when that happened? Hagar got put out, right? Doesn't work. But this man went up from his city year to year to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Remember, Joshua told us that the tabernacle that came across into the promised land at Gilgal was where it was erected. And then later it was moved up to Shiloh, which is in, actually more centrally located than even Jerusalem. If you look at the geography, it's right in the center. So the northern tribes had less distance to go. The southern tribes had a little more distance to go, but they all are about the same, right in the center. It's a great spot. 
it would maybe stayed there except for sin of the people. That's what caused it to be moved, you know. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. So verse three, we're introduced. Not much more said about it. They'll come back to that in chapter two. You see the, the movement of the story. God loves to weave a story like that. I love to read a good story that has literary devices in it, right? And movement of thought in the literature. Well, who do you think invented literature, man? You say, well, I like, I like to read a novel. You should like to read the word of God more. The word of God has every literary device that man could ever use because this is God's word. And God thought of these and he uses them. And he wants us to appreciate it, you know, appreciate the literature as well as apply it, learn it and apply it. And so verse four, whenever the time for Elkanah to make an offering came, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion. Uh, that's a violation of the law, too. You're not supposed to do that. Show favoritism. But the reason? For he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. So you, you already sense it. You sisters will sense it more than the men. But all of us should sense the need here, Hannah is in a position of brokenness, right? She's at, she's at her limits, but that's not all. Her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable. Okay. Well, I'm the fruitful tree here. What happened? You're a dry tree. Or I'm, you know, whatever word she used. Because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord there in Shiloh. That she provoked her. Therefore she wept. And did not eat. You see. Before the blessing of chapter 7 revival comes. Before the blessing of Samuel comes. Hannah and all of us have to be brought to our extremity. We, we call it the end of ourselves. The Bible calls it brokenness. Isaiah 57, 15, right? God looks on the broken and contrite ones. And in 66, 2, he adds, and who tremble at my word, right? If you want to be fruitful for the Lord, and I think you do, most of us do, and you want to be useful. I mean, it's the start of 2023, right? That's a good thing to think of. I, I think that I want that for me. I want that more for you than for me. In wherever your sphere is, and it's different for every one of us in this room, to be useful. But to be useful, we have to be available. And then we have to be yielded, submissive to the Holy Spirit, to the will and purposes of God for me. And that'll be different depending on where he wants to use you. So are you available? Right? Hannah was available, as we'll see in what follows here. But to be put in that position, she had to be brought to the end of depending on anything else that she thought could prop her up. Everything was taken, all the props were taken away. That is good. Although we don't see it at the time as good. I admit, I don't either, right? We complain, we whine, we, we don't like it at first. Okay, that's human. That's a human condition. We accept that. We, and we're going to be generous. We agree to be generous with each other, right? In those circumstances. To give each other room to grow, right? To be gentle, not judgmental not accusatory because we want all of us to succeed for bible 2 chapel to succeed all the believers in bible 2 chapel have to succeed in the lord no that's what he wants so it was she wept and did not eat and she's moved into fasting so that sets up what follows verse 8 then Elkanah, her husband said to her now in addition to all her other problems Imagine this. 
She has a husband that doesn't understand her and her needs. Look what he says. Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than 10 sons? And sisters, what is the answer? Not. So he says, you got me. You don't need any more children than that. You got me. How many narcissistic men think like that? And our society is full of them narcissistic men that's where a lot of these marital problems that we've been having to deal with i was speaking about that in kansas a few years ago and i must have had four sisters come up from there it was a young people's meeting but some of the mothers that brought them there from nebraska and iowa around and they came up to me afterwards they said you just described my husband Ooh. and immediately you know they're suffering and a few of them had had to get away for danger to their lives. I was married to a narcissist, but I didn't know it at the time. Nobody knows it at the time. A narcissist is a master at making himself look good on a short term. He's the most popular person in the room when he walks in. You take him to a marriage counselor and he, and he uses the marriage counselor and makes himself look good at the wife's expense. I mean, he said, you cut me. Hannah, Elkanah, don't you understand that a woman's fulfillment is her ministry in children? That's what 1 Timothy 2.15 tells us, right? That the woman is saved through child rearing. It may not be her children. It may be other people's children. It may be in Sunday school. It may be in children's church. But it's still God's made his sisters for that. And they don't feel fulfilled usually until that's happened. Now, a few of the sisters have been made for ministry to older sisters, and we're thankful for that, like Amy Carmichael and some others. So Hannah <laughs> arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh there at the tabernacle. Now, Ellie, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost at the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul, I can imagine, and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Believers, camp out here for a while. Put yourself as much as you can in her shoes. There's great benefit in that. When we study the word of God, or you're reading through the Bible in a year, which I hope you are, don't be so quick to move over these things. You stop and meditate, right? And, and think about, it. Don't say, well, I got through it in 20 minutes. That's all I need. And close it and go back to your whatever. Spend time in the word of God. And then she, look at verse 11. Oh, she made a vow, which was legitimate under the old covenant, you remember, both in Numbers and in Leviticus, it talks about that, and all the prescriptions for a vow. Oh, Lord of hosts, she uses Yahweh Sabaoth, saying James, the letter of James. The Lord of the Sabbath, we I think it's translated. This is the same word. Yahweh Sabaoth, Jehovah Sabaoth, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. Oh, why did she pick a male child? Wouldn't any child do? She just wanted to have a child, right? A son or a daughter. We have to examine, why is she thinking like that? And I would submit to you this, she's thinking of a deliverer. That's, she knows the condition of the tabernacle. She sees, she's heard from what Hophni and the sisters know of these things. They're messing around with the women at the tabernacle and all that, the sisters know these things. She knows all that. And so she says, use my womb to bring in a judge to replace Eli. Eli's old. He's about to go. Hophni and Phinehas is all we've got. And they're sons of Balaam. You say, how do you know that, brother? And that's a good, that's a fair question for you to ask. And if we only had chapter one, I couldn't, I couldn't make that statement. Although a male child, 
you know, that, that's somewhat of an indi indication. But over in chapter two, in her prayer, in verses one through 10, which is the basis, we believe, of Mary's prayer in the Gospel of Luke. You remember, we call it the Magnificat. That's the Latin word for magnificent. And it's not because Mary's magnificent, it's because the one she's praising is magnificent, right? She's magnifying the Lord. And she goes back to Hannah's prayer. She identifies with Hannah. And that's pretty, pretty awesome to me. And why did she do that? Well, look in Hannah's prayer in verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. That's going to happen. It has happened to some extent, but it's going to, from heaven. He will thunder against them. And we read about the seven thunders in Psalm 29 and in the book of Revelation in chapter 10, which is right at the end of the tribulation period. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. What is she talking about? She's thinking of judges, right? And then look, she says, he will give strength to his king. There was no king yet. She knew the monarchy was coming. How did she know that? The Holy Spirit showed her. And exalt the horn of his Mashiach, Messiah. It's the first time, the first reference to Christ Mashiach is Hebrew for anointed one or Christ, which is the Greek, Christos. And it's in the lips of Hannah. The first reference to Christ in the Bible. Does that make her significant? <laughs> and that's my reason, chapter 2, verse 10, for saying she's thinking way down past the road here. She's not thinking selfishly of just herself. Because she's going to have to give this child up after she wings him. That's what the vow, that's what her vow is. So coming back to verse 11 of chapter 1. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, remember me and not forget your maidservant. But will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to Jehovah, to the Lord, all the days of his life. And no razor shall come upon his head. Which means what? be a Nazarite from his birth all the days of his life <laughs> now the Nazarite vow was usually for a fixed period of time and then a few weeks he could do it even for a few days by the way you can still do it if you want to it's still it's not required but it's biblical but if you do it you're to do it between you and the Lord right but this one's for life now, another thing, when you go back and you study the book of Judges, which is the same time period as the Judges, right? Eli was a judge and Samuel was the last of the Judges. So we're still in the Judges, even though we're in the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel deals with transition into the monarchy. Monarchy hasn't happened yet. And you realize, let's take some study, but this is happening right the same time frame as Samson in Judges 13, 14, 15, and 16. Samson and Samuel, who you can see the, the link to their names, they're very similar. Samson was maybe three or four years older than Samuel. They're right, they were contemporaries. That 20 year overlap between Samson when he judged for 20 years was in the same time frame while Samuel was judging. Only his went longer than 20 years. And there were several of the judges that overlap. You can't just add up all the dates of all the judges. You end up with a time frame that doesn't fit into the, the window we have. We know Saul started his kingdom in 1051. They came into Israel in 1406. And so you fit, fit the time frame from Joshua. Takes some time. But the word of God's worth it. <laughs> Now, again, I could take the time to show you. It'd be better to show you in charts and tables, probably. But a lot of your Bible study, uh, your study Bibles would have that, or commentaries would, would have that. But they overlapped. And to me, I can't help but wonder, again, 
you sisters stay in touch way better than the guys do. And she had to know about what happened to Samson's mom, who was also barren, remember, and had the visit of the angel of the Lord. And, and she had that miraculous birth when she was barren. And now she's saying, hey, and remember, Samson was also a Nazarite from birth. And I just think Hannah had to know this. Whether she did or not, this was on her heart, but maybe she said, look, you did it over there. And remember the territory where Samuel, I mean, where Samson's parents were is right next to Ephraim. You know, the original territory of Dan bordered on the Southern border of Ephraim. So they were just a few hills apart, down a few hills over from where Rama is here. But that to me is fascinating too. It gives you a whole different insight into the ministry of Samson. Because some people look at the ministry of Samson and say, what a failure. He did it all. No, no, that's not what the Bible says. He judged for 20 years. Yes, he said, but he, all he did was uh, distract the Philistines. What if that was his calling, beloved? Each of the judges had their own assignment. You've got your own assignment. I've got my, we don't compete in our assignments. We don't compare our assignments. We all have individual assignments. I believe Samson was a success. I'll go so far as to say that. Because he distracted the Philistines and he will get part of the credit for the Mizpah revival in 1 Samuel chapter seven. That 20 years he's distracting the Philistines. Samuel is going around the country preparing the people for the revival. You think he could have a gathering in chapter seven of the whole nation and have them and challenge them to put away the foreign gods and devote themselves totally to the God and they did it without any groundwork and it just happened spontaneously? It doesn't happen like that. There's all kinds of groundwork that has to happen before any revival, even in the church age. And Samuel was the one that did that. Not only that, there's another one. There's another person that we think of maybe as a failure that'll get credit for that revival, the Mizpah revival of 1084 BC. And that'll be Eli. You say, well, Eli, he was a total failure with his two sons. I'll grant you that. Although we don't know the detailed circumstances, he may have raised them right. You know, you can raise children right. I have no, I know a lot of Christian parents that did everything right. And then the kids went like this after they got out of the home, right? So, and you can't, there's a lot of circumstances here. Be careful when you're throwing rocks, you live in a glass house too. Right? Be careful of rush to judgment. I, you know, I have a tendency to rush to judgment sometimes too. And we all rush to judgment too fast without all the facts. We never have all the facts that God has, but we should have more facts than, than what we usually do. But who raised Samuel? Eli. <laughs> Everything Samuel learned, he learned at the feet of Eli. Eli got him when he was four years old. She brings him to the tabernacle at four. And by 17, he's already at a position, say anywhere between 14 and 17, he's at a position where he has to take over <laughs> because Ellie drops dead when the ark is captured. And God put all this together. So we come back. Chapter one, she's going to give the child to the Lord. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, verse 12, and it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Ellie watched her mouth. And here's another rush to judgment, right? And Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Ellie thought, she's drunk. Can you imagine coming to the tabernacle drunk? I wish you had thought about Hophni and Phineas that way, uh, brother, because, you know, but he does challenge them in chapter two. So, so he says to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, look at this. I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink. In fact, I'm fasting, but I poured out my soul before the Lord. 
And when someone pours out their soul before the Lord, other people think they're drunk. That's why Ephesians 5.18 says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit or be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a continuous present. Why? Because when someone's being filled with the Holy Spirit, it looks like they're drunk. They're just ecstatic, but it's about the Lord and self is reduced and they're in full cognizance of their faculties, right? They know what they're doing. That commands to all of us, you know, being, being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's to every born again Christian ought to be doing that. And it's measurable. You can measure it. Other people can measure it in you better than we can, but it's measurable. That growth, right? It's, we're talking about spiritual growth. So she answers, do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, literally a daughter of Balaam. It's interesting. It says that in verse 16 of chapter 1, and then we find out his two sons are sons of Balaam, chapter 2. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. That is genuine prayer. Pouring out your heart, beseeching the Lord, put off the mask, the religious mask, right? Being transparent, sincere, and honest before the Lord. Ah, oh, it's so easy to be a pretender. Finally get authentic and genuine before the Lord. I say that to myself too, because we all have that tendency, especially at church, at gathering, right? Harder to do at home sometimes. And so Ellie then, as high priest, as God's high priest says, go in peace. The God of Israel will grant your petition, which you've asked of him. That's pretty big. And remember, he's speaking with authority of the, of the high priesthood. And that's all she needed to hear, because look at the change. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way, ate, no longer fasting, and her face was no longer sad. She believed him. She believed God spoke through him. So they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord had returned and came to house at Rama and Elkanah, knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Ah, she's pregnant. So it came to, to, to fast in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have Ask for him from the Lord. His name either means asked for from the Lord or heard of the Lord. Heard of the Lord, I think, you know, in other words, heard, the Lord heard her prayer and responded, right? So Elkanah and all his house, they went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. Notice his vow, that's important because in Numbers and in Leviticus, that when a, when a wife or a daughter makes a vow, it has to be authenticated by the male, whether it be the husband or the father, and he could negate their vow. So Elkanah took it on, Hannah's vow is his. They're in agreement. Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned and I'll take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. And look at that, remain there forever. Your firstborn, you sisters that have had more than one, <laughs> your firstborn, she longed for this child and she's going to give him up. Now, after the child is born, she still has a choice to make, right? After the weaning, is she really going to do it? You know, we're all sitting, I'm sitting on the, are you really going to do it? You finally got the child, aren't you going to hold him? Oh, she does it. And this really speaks to her spirituality. This is a spiritually mature sister in Christ. Now, when she'd weaned him, verse 24, she took him up with her with three bulls, one heap of flour and skin of wine, and brought him all part of the Nazarite vow to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young, we think, three or four years old. And when they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Ellie, and she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. Who's she giving credit to? The Lord. She's giving her testimony. 
I am that woman, the one you thought was drunk. She doesn't say that and put that on him. But I am that woman for this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of them. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. <laughs> I've loaned him out to the Lord. That had to hurt. And we find out later, she would make a coat for him and bring it up year after year as he grew. You know, she'd make it a little bigger each time as an excuse to go see him. For this child I pray, therefore I've also lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. And then you wanna know what she worshiped? You wanna know what her heart is on the inside? That's her prayer in verses one through 10. Verse 11, Hokana, chapter two, went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest, starting from three or four years old. Now that tabernacle complex was big. There was a lot of space. And we, we know that there were sisters that were working there because uh, that chapter two tells us that there were other men, Levites working there. There were quarters there for the high priest and his son, but also there were quarters there for Samuel. You talk about going to seminary and being brought up at the feet of one of, of the greatest professor in Israel at the time, which would be Eli, the high priest, who had a copy of the law. <laughs> learning the Hebrew, learning the history, learning, learning all the details of the tabernacle, learning all that. I mean, that was his whole life, starting at that age, God set him apart for this because God was going to use Samuel to turn the whole nation back to God. One person. You say, can one, one person, can I, my little life make a difference? My little testimony? All he needs is one person that's totally committed to him, like her, like Hannah, like Samuel. Samuel never deviated. He, we think he lived to be about 100. He had an influence for a long time. Anointed Saul, anointed David. Saw that that whole thing happened. The last of the judges started the school of the prophets, which was kind of like a little seminary or Bible school that they had. Remember, it was down in Jericho during the time of Elijah and Elisha. It's the same school of the prophets. Samuel started it. It was his idea under God. The whole idea of training up the next generation. And you say, well, who taught Samuel? Eli. Eli taught him about discipleship and training up and having certain disciplines in your life and all of that. And God was able to use him to turn the nation back. They went from going like this to going like this. And you know the time of David and Solomon? You don't find it in your secular history books. I took history in college. They didn't even have you know, two pages and all these pages about Alexander the Great. You're not great to me. Jesus is great. But, but they had all, all these pages about Julius Caesar. But oh, took a couple of pages. And then the kingdom under Solomon and David was the greatest kingdom this, the world has ever seen. It's right here in the Bible. But compared to the Lord Jesus' kingdom, minimal compared to his that's coming. Are you a part of that? If you're trusting Jesus Christ as your savior, you'll be a part of that kingdom. If you're not trusting him, no way. The lake of fire is ahead for you. We all deserve to go to the lake of fire. Amen. Dan, I appreciate that. There are only, a, uh, but now I have to add a six. I've only had, there were five other people in my life I've met that had birthday on the 31st of January. Now there are six, because I know Dan. But we're, we're all, Dan, myself, all of us, headed to the lake of fire. Jesus is the only way to keep us from there. Right, David? The only way. So trust him today. Father, we thank you for this witness that you've given us in the word of God. The witness of Hannah, Samuel, we just got an introduction to him, Eli, the high priest, and these others, Lord. Help us to learn the lessons and apply them and to rejoice in your word 
and to treasure your word like the writer of the Proverbs tells us and hide it in our hearts. What a day we live in, Lord. We need to stay close to you and loyal to you, submitted to you and be fruitful for you in the process. Be with us as we start this new week. Take us all home safely, we ask. In the Lord Jesus' name, we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen.